everyone. I have the privilege and honor of speaking to an incredible panel before us today and also the chance to introduce them very shortly. Um, I want to take a moment to just lay out our objectives for today's panel and also um, my excitement for it. I'm personally very excited for this discussion because I know it will be equal parts inspiring, candid and unconventional and I'm certain our panelists will not disappoint. Our objective is to gain a practitioner's perspective on the last decade of public consultations and help us spark ideas of what the next few decades could look like. To start with, I would first like to pose our first question to Sri Abhishek Singh, sir. Um, so, we, before I dive into the questions, I'll just quickly like to introduce you to the, those who need some introduction to Mr. Abhishek Singh. Sri Abhishek Singh is a career civil servant with 27 years of experience in governance and policy formulation. He specializes in the use of technology for improving governance. In his role as President and CEO of the National E-Governance Di Division and the MD and CEO of Digital India Corporation, he leads major Digital India initiatives including projects in the field of artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. He is also the CEO of Karmiyogi Bharat, a government capacity building task platform uh, which is tasked with building capacity of all civil servants. He has completed a master's in public administration from Harvard Kennedy and also is an alumnus of IIT Kanpur. Thank you for joining us today, sir. So I think my question for you to start with is that you have led many pioneering initiatives to enable governance through the effective use of technology. I'm sure the audience is very keen to hear your perspective on how the landscape of governance is actually evolving through the use of technology. Like, uh, as you rightly said, as technology has evolved, what we have seen over a period of time is that uh, citizens have got used to technology in a greater sense. The expansion of mobile phones which led people from go from landline phones to mobile internet. And if today we have like uh, a large number of people, almost 900 million people connected to with smartphones, accessing services, and they are able to do e-commerce, they are able to watch YouTube and they are able to access private services. There is a huge demand for public services. There was a time around 15 years back when we were building IT services and we were trying to have takers for those services. So as against what was the time around 15-20 years back, today there is more and more demand. Like citizens feel that why can't government do it online? Why do I need to go and queue to in a public office to get a service? Why can't I get complete information on a government portal? Why aren't the government services as efficient as the private services? So those things have built in and that brings in a greater, uh, not only gives it an opportunity for us, but a chance to build systems that can solve problems. And when we start using technology for governance, we realize that the last mile service delivery, especially where discretion comes in, where in all kinds of misgovernance, bribery, corruption, uh, harassment of citizens, all those pain points of citizens can be mitigated to a great level by use of technology. And what we have seen in several projects, whether it's offering, uh, using technology for enabling financial services or whether giving information to services, citizens have lapped it up. We don't do that much of promos for digital services, but almost every service, whether it is UPI or whether it's uh, Aadhaar related services or even DigiLocker, more and more people are using it because they get benefits for it. And government also benefits because the uh, stated objective of all government departments, transparency, better governance, and there have been several impact assessment studies which says that how governance improves, uh, waiting time goes down, bribery goes down. So it's a win-win for everyone using technology for improving governance. Thank you for that perspective, sir. I think uh, we couldn't agree more and we're big fans of using technology effectively. Some of our key learnings have in fact been from the pioneering work that is being conducted by the government of India and, and can't agree more on how it's a very important tool to be used. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Bajpai, as a policy maker who has turned, uh, as an in industrialist, uh, industry leader who has turned policy maker, uh, which is a transition which is, which is new to most. Um, I do have a question for you, Mr. Bajpai, but first I would like to introduce you to those um, who are joining us today. Mr. G. M. Bajpai is a distinguished leader in Indian business and professor emeritus of finance at the National Insurance Academy. He is the former chairman of SEBI, prior to which he was the chairman of the Life Insurance Corporation of India. He has been the chairperson of the Corporate Governance Task Force of the International Organization of Securities Commissions and the chairperson of the Insurance Institute of India. Today, 
He is also an acclaimed author with five published books and regular columns published in Daily Jagran, Mint, and Syndicate Billion Press. Uh, Mr. Bajpai's enduring commitment to public consultations and his work at SEBI has set the precedent for many other regulators to follow suit, which is why we're delighted to have him with us today and also as a part of our jury. So as I was... Um, <laughs> As I was mentioning, sir, as an industry veteran who turned policymaker, I think one of my biggest curiosities has been how has India's policy landscape in evolved to include greater citizens' participation? If we could hear your perspective on that, that would be very much. Antara, first, thank you very much for this elaborate introduction. Well, friends, uh, to be honest with you, I am trying to de-risk myself from the biggest risk to a human being called oxidations. I'm an old foggy who has the tendency of losing touch with the ground realities and academic developments. So, <laughs> thank you very much for introducing me. I was having been sort of uh, bound by the diplomatic language for 40 years when I used to work with the government. I am now an academic, so I can be free. In India, <laughs> the public consultation is still evolving. In fact, it is in a very infancy state. As Dr. Balu was saying, the market is willing. The government, the policy makers are ready to take your consultation. But actually the consultation is not happening. Uh, there are three, four reasons. First and foremost, there are a few enthusiastic organizations and the ministries who are wanting <coughs> consultation of a serious nature and involvement. Some examples he has quoted. But there are some who are very reluctant. Some who are, in fact, apathetic. They think that following the regulatory or the legislative obligation is enough, and they're the processes. And therefore, my personal feeling is, the very fact that you started, the very fact there's an organization called CIVIS, the very fact that you are called at least a small group of people to listen to all of us, there is a development. And I can see this happening over a period of time. But it's a process, and any process has a process of evolution. This is evolving, and hopefully it will mature in a couple of years. Thank you, thank you, Vajpayee sir. Um, I have a question for Dr. Sahu, given that he was involved very closely in the process at IBBI from the very beginning. Um, IBBI, uh, I won't jump to my question, I will resist the urge to jump to my question without the introduction. But to introduce Dr. Sahu, Dr. Sahu is a practicing advocate who most recently served as a distinguished professor at the National Law University in Delhi. He was the founding chairperson of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India, where he weaved public consultation into the design of the organization right from its inception. He has also been a member of the Competition Commission of India, secretary of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India, full-time member of SEBI, and economic advisor with the National Stock Exchange. As a member of the Indian Economic Service, Dr. Sahu has served several ministries of the in the government of India. Dr. Sahu, I think I revealed a little bit of my question beforehand, but um, IBBI has been unique in its approach to consultation, ensuring that it has its, had its ear to the ground from the very beginning. How do you see consultation having shaped the code as it stands today? Uh, I think when we talked about, okay, let me first thank CBX for this uh, pioneering initiative and making me a part of uh, this selection process, jury process. So when we talk about to consultation, we may name it three spaces. One is the statute made by the legislature, rules made by the executive, and the regulations made by the regulators. So as regards code, code is in the domain of the government or legislature, so I would not like to talk much about that, though I know government had extensive consultations in a different formats while making the code as well as amending it six times in this past five years. But I will talk about the regulations part of which IBBI was directly associated. And in fact, by the time IBBI came in, substantial work had happened in the space of public consultation, as you saw. The rules, the rules, there was a requirement since 1950 or so that rules will be pre-notified before the final publication coming into force. We didn't call that principle as public consultation, but something implicit that was there. And Mr. Baspai was the pioneer in the 
concertation, a public concertation having started by any regulatory agency before any legal requirement in 2002. And, uh, and you just saw that Mr. Malhotra, who we pioneered this in the, in the legislation space. Mr. Vajpayee was in the regulatory space. Mr. Malhotra, the author of that circular on the uh, legislation space. And by 2016, the Supreme Court had taken notice of that also in Cellular Operators Association of India. There was an advice to government that please make a provision in legislation requiring consultations for subordinate legislation. So that means by 2016, when IPBI came, uh, it is sort of there is an expectation that any law rules regulations is made has to go through this process. But IPBI had another necessity that elsewhere, let's say for SEPI, before SEPI was born, there was a market, it was a, it was a already developed market, a regulation was there. It was there for centuries. SEPI came into the space, carried it forward. Telecom was there for decades, TRI came in and it carried it forward. But when IBBI came in or IBC came in, they absolutely started from the zero mile, what we call. Absolutely no knowledge, no rules. So how in this kind of insolvency regime works, none, had, none in the country had an idea. So only option left for IBBI was to work with the stakeholders. So it was rather more of a necessity that we either we swim and sink together. In fact, people started calling this as a kind of insolvency reforms for, by, and of the stakeholders. So the very first set of regulations that came in within two months of IPA's existence, it was completely done by the people who were to be regulated. And in fact, since Mr. Balasopan was mentioning about the John Bhagidari, I will give one example how IPBI has done John Bhagidari. In fact, I shared you with one article which I wrote with my co-author Dr. C.K. J. Nair on when the regulated become regulator. So IPBI has a practice that, as usual like every other regulator, IPBI puts out a discussion paper, draft legislation, six comments, gives 30 days, all those things it does. But beyond that it has something different. It uses of course a technology in a great way and it started using technology from day one it was born. Uh, so it does that in April every year, it invites people that please give me suggestions, general suggestions, whatever you want in the regulation space in insolvency, as well as the specific suggestions. And for that specific suggestions, the technology platform enables, let's say there are 500 pages of regulations. So for there are specific regulation numbers, sub-clause, sub-regulation, all those things are configured in that technology. And it says that please tell us what you change in which provision you want to tell us. This process remains, IPBI calls it crowdsourcing of ideas. This process remains open for nine months till December. So people at their leisure, they can contemplate on the issues, give the suggestions what they want. Then IPBI looks at those suggestions in between, but even if it is not done in January, it takes all of them together, processes, and if any change in regulations is required, based on this, notify them before 31st March, new laws come into force from 1st April. So this is how it has made Bhagidari a reality that people, regulators, regulated, come in the shoes of the regulator and ask the regulator, this is the regulation I want. They can give specific suggestion, they can also give a general suggestion that this regulation does not work at all, you have to shift to a different pattern, all these are possible. So this is how IPBI has moved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sangu. I think um, it's always commendable to see the different forms that consultation can take, um, some of which we've already spoken about. But I would love Dr. Shah to enumerate on that a little bit. Um, I'll just quickly introduce Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah, Dr. Parth Shah is the Dean and Co-Founder of the Indian School of Public Policy and Founder of the Center for C of Civil Society. ISPP's mission is to create next-gen policy leaders for a rising India. Through full-time and part-time courses taught online, offline and in hybrid mode, it de democratizes the process of policy education and builds policy capacity of Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar, themes that we've all touched upon today. His re recent focus is on fixing politics and he spends his time delving deeper into what that could look like in India. Dr. Shah, I think my question for you is um, we've seen and heard of many best practices in technology, use of technology and governance, um, as well as in consultation in India. 
but would you like to perhaps shed some light on some of the global best practices in the domain that you might have come across that have been interesting case studies that we could follow as well? Thank you. <coughs> First of all, thank you for making ISPP as a partner uh, for this event. And I think first also I want to congratulate you and your team, Antara, uh, for initiating this, taking this initiative, sustaining it, right, and actually growing it. Uh, as you mentioned, I have also started other organizations of similar kind, and you know how much how much is it takes to start and run an organization and fulfill this public purpose. So my congratulations to you and your team. Very well done. Uh, let me, before I answer your question, I was just thinking about when I heard uh, Dr. Balu's presentation and of course comments that were made outside. There's one area I see a lot of justifications for participation of the public. I think there's one important argument that we must keep in mind why it is important to have this participation from the public, right? And that is that in a, even in a democracy, the elected government gets elected with far fewer votes than one would normally think, right? So there is no political party in India's history has ever received more than 50% of the votes, right? This is the people who are casting vote. I'm not saying 50% of citizens, right? which is a very different number altogether, right? And so I think highest uh, proportional vote that any party has received was Congress in 1984, came close to 50%, 49% uh, vote they received, right? So it's important to remember for every elected government, right, that they are representing actually a small minority of citizens. Right? And therefore, I think it becomes very critical to think about participation of citizens and in the process of regulation, in the process of legislation, right, in both of those areas and many other the government uh, does uh, take initiative. Right? I think there's an important argument to be reminded uh, that is not a favor being done to citizens. Uh, it's really something that has to be done in the, if you believe in genuine democracy. I, think I was just uh, saying that, thinking about that this will like to public participation. And a friend of mine told me just before coming here that South Africa has such a right. right? So you, there's a right given to citizens that government must take their participation seriously uh, in the in the legislative process. Right? I think in terms of global based practices, there are many. Uh, the couple of them that I really have been pursuing uh, in little more detail in my own sort of work uh, is the idea of citizens assembly. Right? So it's a very powerful idea implemented now in quite a few countries around the world. Right? Uh, a classic example, obviously, is uh, uh, Ireland, uh, where they have to make a decision about what the law is going to be on abortion, right? Uh, and no political party wanted to touch uh, that issue, right? So finally they decided to have a citizens assembly, randomly chosen citizens uh, who came to that assembly, deliberated, debated, their access to all the experts, right? And they made a decision at the end of uh, several months of deliberations about what sort of position to take for Ireland on that very divisive issue. And that really has uh, sustained itself when it's passed in the law. So there are many issues of those kinds which require that citizens directly participate. So assemblies are one way of doing it. Uh, the second idea, which I think is a very old idea, starting with the Greek uh, republics, which is the idea of random selection. So you have a sort of a pool of people who meet certain basic qualifications, right, uh, depending on the job uh, requirement. But within that pool, you randomly select who is going to be actually occupying the chair. Uh, and that was done also in the Chola Empire in India. So we also have a history of similar kind of practice in, Indian, in India. So I think those are really interesting examples of how far we can push the envelope uh, in getting citizens to participate, not just in terms of getting comments, but also making important decisions. Thank you so much for that. And that actually uh, brings me very nicely to my next question for Abhishek sir, which is that you led and um, Develop MyCuff as a portal, which is now seen as one of the globally most um, scalable citizen engagement practices um, in the world. Would love to hear from you a little bit about how that process was to set up an organization, a platform like this, and um, how it's evolved over time. 
MyGov actually was uh, launched in 2014. I happened to be part of MyGov uh, during one of the most difficult periods uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic from 19 to 22. And uh, MyGov, as you rightly said, is the citizen and given platform. And the government has set up primarily with the objective of involving citizens in policy making as also disseminating information to the citizen, demystifying governance. So very often what we see in a democratic setup, while we always say government is of the people, by the people, for the people, but very often people get a chance to vote only once in five years. In normal cases, when they exercise their mandate, and that also as Partha mentioned, ki that the government is selected might not be the will of the people, uh, majority of the people who are voting for the government. So it becomes very, very important that when government decides certain important things which impact the citizens, we do go back to the citizens, consult them, take their perspective and try to ensure that we are not missing out on any aspect for that. So towards that objective, Baiga has, indulged, has kind of engaged with citizens in some, several important aspects. And one particular example that I would like to cite is the, the new education policy. So when the new education policy was being drafted, one opinion came in that while educational experts and civil servants and all were involved in the drafting process, but ultimately it was going to impact millions of students parents and teachers. It was important to get the perspective of everyone. So the Ministry of Education came up with a very extensive consultation exercise, one of the largest that I had seen in which meetings, like actual physical meetings were held even in every Gram Panchayat. And the Gram Shiksha Samiti sat through and then the education officials went, explained the provisions of the law and then people gave their comments and all these comments were then put up on the MIGA folder because physically correcting them would not have made sense, but analyzing it would have been like a humongous task. So all that comments came in a digital format to to us and then we kind of ran a software to do analytics and try to identify which are the key issues which have been highlighted by most people in the education department went through extensive process of going through those suggestions and a lot of provisions as planned in the new education policy was revised based on that. So one of the most extensive and then of course several other laws have been done. Another thing that, uh, that the Ministry of Finance does every year is the consultations with the budgets. What happens is that uh, in the run-up to the budget formulation, the finance minister and the finance ministry engages with people of various sectors, from industry, associations, all of them go and give their representations with regard to what are their expectations of the budget. But the Aam Aadmi, the citizen doesn't get a chance to come to North Block and give their views. So what my job used to do was that launch a consultation process with the union budget and that kind of democratized access, democratized access to each and every citizen to go to the MyGov portal, give their views, give their ask with regard to what they want from the budget. Of course, most people would ask for that there should be no taxes, but there are a lot many people who would also give very constructive suggestions and Ministry of Finance would again go through them and very often many of these suggestions found a place in the union budget. And the finance minister would write to all those people who had contributed, thanking them for doing that. And over and above, apart from policy consultations, MyGov also did something like uh, crowdsourcing of ideas and crowdsourcing of what we call logos of various schemes and programs. And one of the most visible logo of a government program, the Swachh Bharat program, was actually crowdsourced through MyGov. The Digital India logo was crowdsourced through MyGov. So what it does is that when we ask citizens to contribute a logo, one, we save a lot of design costs, but it also helps us to reach out to citizens that a new program, a new scheme is being launched. So that establishes a lot of credibility. And the second part which MyGov does is demystifying. Because most of the government regulations, rules, orders are very often written in a lot of bureaucraties and legalese which doesn't make much sense to most citizens. Like especially I remember during COVID-19, my colleague Shubha is sitting here, he would agree that uh, with the lockdown orders and the unlockdown orders were being issued, but a lot many people would not know ki kya khulega, kya band rahega. They would not make, uh, make, those things would not make head or tail off to most people. So what we did was I tried to demystify it. The simple infographics, kya karna hai, do's and don'ts. Not. So that it meant a very powerful tool in communications, in driving behavioral change. So MyGov, the entire experience, in fact, I can go on and on about what all we did, but it became a very, very powerful tool to serve as a bridge between government and citizens, ensure constant communications from the citizens to the government and from the government to the citizens. And that, I think, is a hallmark for any democracy. Is Jan Sahabakita, Jan Bhagidari, makes a democracy more robust, make the citizens own up the government and make the citizens feel a part of the government.